Well, that being said, right now we'll go through some excerpts off the Bamenda Proclamation as concerns these two case studies, Mungwa and, sorry, Munzu and Ayangwe. In the light of the foregoing, the Anglophone people of Cameroon meet Bamenda in the second All Anglophone Conference AAC2, solemnly, solemnly adopt and issue the following proclamation excerpts. Um, six, it says, should the government either persist in its refusal to engage in meaningful constitutional talks or fail to engage in such talks within a reasonable time, the Anglophone Council shall inform the Anglophone people by all suitable means. It shall thereupon proclaim the revival of the independence of the Anglophone territory of the Southern Cameroon and all necessary measures to secure, defend and preserve the independent sovereignty and integrity of the said territory. And seven, following the proclamation of the revival of the independence and sovereignty of Southern Cameroon's Amazonia, as provided for herein above, the Anglophone Council shall, without having to convene another session of the All Anglophone Conference, transform itself into the Southern Cameroon's Constituent Assembly for the purpose of drafting, debating, and adopting a constitution for the independence and sovereign state of Southern Cameroon's Amazonia. Now, this was read by Dr. Simone Munzu in Bamenda, with tears flowing from his eyes. Now, in June 1995, S.T. Muna, Simone Munzu, Ekontag Alad, J.N. Foncha, Njolu Timbe, and many others crossed the Mungo Bridge with the UN flag after trip to New York to make case for an independent Southern Cameroon state. During the Anglophone crisis, the AAC 1 and 2, Boya and Bamende, Bamenda, we had two secretaries, Dr. Muzio from the Southwest and Professor Ayangwe Carlson from the Northwest. As if God knew the confusion ahead with time and the hearts of two secretaries, late statesman Muna and Foncha did their best to explain how they got themselves entangled in a failed union that was tentative or had a trial period. He goes on to say, I remember late statesman Dr. Foncha shedding tears when he was held to hostage for selling West Cameroon. Late Dr. Fon's action in tears caused the writing of the memorandum of the UN to separation. Copy of the memorandum in the hands of the secretaries who today are showing their true colors of betrayal since they can't bite the fingers that fit them. Now, during the AAC, AAC 1 and 2, no frank of the meeting as such, if our two secretaries had made the of meant to know the outcome of the memorandum the nasty situation today could have caused the killings of west cameroonians now looking at the picture below you find munzu elad late panjo late pa abam and new life john frundi etc well i don't blame the BS administration for the ongoing confusion but munzu elad ayangwe john frundi for not holding on the truth and blessing late pa foncha and muna gave us to continue now, it should be noted that a a ACC3 can only hold when Munzu, Ayangwe, etc. are no more if their presence were necessary. If it were to hold with all the sellouts you find in the picture in attendance, consider it a free-for-all flight that, to continue based on your public reaction. You'll get senior barrister John and so involved to know. Now, a look at Chief Charles A. Taku's comments on Dr. Munzu. He says, I have listened to a pathetic apology of the atrocity crimes committed against Southern Cameroons by Dr. Munzo. In particular, his allegation that mass killing of members of the group is a requirement for the crime of genocide. Now, the reasoning is inconsistent with the law and the jurisprudence of International Criminal Tribunal Court. The ICTR is prosecutor versus Jean Paul. Akaso case number ICTR 964-T, Defend Genocide Article 2, Section 3 of the Statute of the Tribunals as follows. Paragraph 494, it says genocide means 
any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethical, racial, or religious group as such. One, killing members of a group. B, of it causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. C, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. D, imposing measures intended to prevent birth within the group. And E, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Now, continuing on Charles Taku's comment, he goes on to say the trial judgment determined and the appeal judgment confirmed that inflicting any of the enumerated acts against a single member of the group with the required dolu specialized, specially special intent was enough for a crime of genocide to be found to have been committed. Akayesu was found guilty of genocide for specific acts which occurred at a checkpoint where persons were targeted for their Tutsi ethnic identity through a showing of identity cards and the alleged presence of Southern Cameroons in La Republic du Cameroon or the alleged widespread attacks or targeting are not legal requirement. Dr. Munzu miscomprehends the law on this issue. Furthermore, conflates the widespread and systematic requirements of contextual elements for crimes against humanity with context elements of genocide. He may not be aware of the jurisprudence of international courts and tribunals, many which according cases in which I participated that crimes against humanity and genocide may occur outside an armed conflict. Now this is signed Charles Taku. We brought to you those in the pursuit of sovereignty, how long they've been in the race and their failures. And we also brought to you the team cruising to Boya. And those who try to trip and fail us are going to bear the brunt of the consequences.